The midday sun was beating down. It seemed extra harsh that day, oppressive and unforgiving. I stopped to catch my breath. Each step felt slower than the last as I made my way up the hill to Jacob's well just outside of town. The steps I took to collect water felt like the steps I was taking in life. All uphill, all a struggle, all alone. I was alone. The words echoed deep down inside of me. A relentless darkness seemed to follow me wherever I went. Sometimes the people in the village would whisper to each other as I walked by. Sometimes they would shake their heads. Sometimes they would simply look down. And I always felt less than. Less than what my parents had hoped for. Less than other women in the village. It was easier to come to the well midday, alone, avoiding the other women and their cruel words and judgmental glares. This isn't how I thought my life would turn out. I had been worn down by the judgments that were hurled at me day after day, the spoken and unspoken ones. My poor choices buried me in a pit of regret I could not climb out of. All I had ever longed for was to be loved. For me, just for who I was, was I even worthy of love? When I arrived at the well, I noticed a man who looked quite weary and exhausted. I saw he had nothing to draw water with, and the well is very deep. I stopped to catch my breath. I watched in silence as the stranger wiped the sweat from his brow. He looked, not so much at me, but into me. He smiled. Please give me a drink, he said. The words he spoke were life and breath. He hadn't really come for water. He had come for me. We aren't even given her name. She's simply the woman at the well. As you read through the Gospels, you meet different characters all the way through the ministry of Jesus. Lazarus, Mary Magdalene, blind Bartimaeus. But this woman's name is not revealed. And I think that's helpful. Because I think in so many ways, she represents each and every one of us. But ultimately, this story isn't about her. This is a story about Jesus and the footprints that he left in Samaria. I want to encourage you to open up your Bible to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John chapter 4. If you could choose only one chapter of the Bible to pass on to others in order to tell them about salvation, it might be John chapter 4. If I only had one story from the life of Jesus to share with someone else who was seeking after God, it might be this one. Because this story, this chapter, this encounter contains all the elements of the gospel. It reveals the impact of sin. It displays the depth of our need for God. It illustrates God's redemptive plan. It demonstrates and reveals the character of Jesus. And it shows the dramatic transformation of a life that has been touched by and given over to following Jesus. The only other story that comes close is the parable of the prodigal son, which does a very similar thing. But it is a parable, an illustration, a made-up story. This, the story of the woman at the well, actually happened. The chapter begins with the disciples trying to figure out what is Jesus up to. They are surprised to learn that John the Baptist um, is, is outpacing Jesus when it comes to popularity among the people. But Jesus isn't concerned with his success as an influencer. He is laser focused on his mission to seek and save those who are lost. 
In verse 3, it says that Jesus left Galilee, left Judea, and went back once more to Galilee. But in order to get there, verse 4 tells us he had to go through Samaria. Now, that geographical detail is not true. There are other ways he could have gone. Judea is up here. Galilee is down here. Samaria is right in the middle. So while it is the straightest path, it's not the easiest one. In fact, in so many ways, it's the most difficult. And it's not the popular route. Samaria is to be avoided. It's the wrong side of the tracks. And in Jesus' day, no spiritual leader worth their salt would have gone that way. The proper way was to travel west and to go down the far side of the Jordan River and then cross back into Galilee, avoiding Samaria completely. Samaria is still in the Palestinian area of Israel today. It's in the West Bank, and it is still an area that people choose to avoid. So when the Bible says he had to go through Samaria, we realize that God is up to something bigger. And I assume that there were some heavy conversations that took place along the road between Jesus and his disciples. Why there? Why now? When the prophet Isaiah describes the Samaritan, uh, the prophet Ezra describes the Samaritan people, he says this in Ezra 9:11, they are unclean with pollutants. They are the, the people with the people of the land. They are filled with abominations. They are seen as unclean. In fact, the Pharisees did not even view them as a people. They despise them, and we see echoes of this hate still lingering today. For Jesus to say that he had to go through Samaria is just wrong. It was morally wrong. It was religiously wrong, and it was factually wrong because there was a better way, an easier way to go unless God was doing something that required them to pass through Samaria. And what we learn about Jesus is that Jesus takes the uncommon path. He takes the difficult way into the wilderness in order to provide people with a way out. And the same is true in your life. Your salvation is only possible because Jesus took the initiative. He left the throne room of heaven, laid aside his divine privileges. He took a downward difficult journey that led to a manger, a cross, and a grave. He faced rejection and took on suffering. He took the narrow way that led him to Samaria. And Jesus still goes to great lengths to meet us in our place of need today. In the areas of brokenness and in our sin. Just like God came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden and Moses and Hannah in the wilderness, God comes looking for lost people today. And in verse 4, the disciples have a decision to make. Would they follow Jesus? Would they go against everything they believed about Samaria and follow Jesus there? Now, sometimes the disciples, maybe even often the disciples, look like a bunch of goofy sidekicks in the Gospels. They are like the Keystone Cops. They are constantly getting it wrong, making wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. But this is what I love about them. Here, when they are confronted with doing something that goes against what they've been taught, that pushes back against the popular opinion of the religious people of their day, they are willing to change their thinking and behavior and follow Jesus. And so perhaps for the first time in their lives, they follow Jesus on mission. And mission is messy and mission takes them to Samaria. Think about your own life. Is there a place 
where Jesus is leading you? Is he leading you into a difficult situation? A place where you're going to have to trust him. A place that is hard. We prayed for and commissioned our junior high students and our high school leaders who are heading off to Windsor. Their mission experience will be challenging. It will be hard. But it's exactly where you want to be. Maybe there's a person in your life who, that Jesus might be asking you to reach out to, to care for, or to witness to. Maybe God is sending you to serve in a particular area. Like the disciples, you have a choice to make. Will you follow Jesus down the difficult path? Or will you stick to the comfort and easier route that others are taking? If we desire to see our friends and our neighbors and our towns have an encounter with the living God, then we need to ask ourselves if we're willing to follow the footsteps of Jesus in Samaria. The story begins to unfold in verse 4. It says, He came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. What is remarkable to notice about Jesus is that he leads with vulnerability. John describes the scene for us. Jesus is sitting beside the well in the desert heat at high noon, tired out from his long journey all by himself. And along comes a woman with a water jar. And the first thing he says to her is, please, will you give me a drink? How long had Jesus sat there with a parched throat Longing for water. A group of us were in Samaria last summer, and the wilderness heat is no joking matter. It can kill you. The need for water was real. And surely if the Messiah wants some water, he could access the well himself. I mean, he could call forth water from the rock. But no... He waits. He waits so that when this woman appears, she can recognize him as the incarnate Messiah who has come. In the midst of his vulnerabilities, his humanity, his need, he actually suffers for her, even as he will suffer for us. His dry lips foreshadow the cross where once again he will thirst in a lonely place in the, date, in the heat of the day at noon and he will ask for water with the words, I thirst. And on that terrible day, he will not receive a drink of water. He will only receive the mockery of vinegar from the foot of the cross. And he will suffer and he will die in our place so that he is able to give us living water. In John 7, 37, he says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Jesus says, For whoever believes in me, as scriptures has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. You see, we are taught to hide our vulnerabilities. We are, 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 are schooled to look self-sufficient and strong. But Jesus gives us permission to be real, to acknowledge our needs, our weaknesses, and our failures, to acknowledge where we are thirsty. And so my question for you is, where do you need to be refreshed by Jesus today? Where are you in need where are you struggling today? Where are you feeling dry? Where are you experiencing doubt or fear? Where are you tripped up by sin? We don't have to pretend. We can be real. 
we can be vulnerable because Jesus is waiting at the well for you. In verse 9, the Samaritan woman says to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you even ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The third thing I want you to notice is that Jesus breaks through the barriers of isolation. You see, sin always separates. It separates us from God. It separates us from each other. It separates us from who the life and the abundant and eternal life that God wants for us to have. And Jesus breaks through the religious rules to interact with this woman. He breaks through the enmity between Jews and Gentiles that was ancient and entrenched and bitter. I mean, these two groups hated each other. They, they disagreed about everything, everything that mattered, how to honor God, how to interpret the scriptures, where to worship. They, they, they gathered together to practice their faith in separate places. They read different versions of the Torah. They avoided social contact with each other whenever possible. They hated each other's guts. Moreover, the Samaritan is a woman when it was not culturally appropriate for Jesus, a Jewish man, to converse alone with a Samaritan woman, much less ask her for a drink of water. And Jesus is so beautifully radical because this is not the sort of thing that was done. She is an outsider. She is a heretic, a stranger, and a foreigner. She represents all the boundaries that must not be transgressed in the religious life. And yet grace and love break through. And that is really good news for you and me. Because we too, without Christ, are on the outside. On our own, we are lost. We are in need. We are separated by sin and by shame. We are broken and we are isolated. We do not belong. But just as Jesus came for her, Jesus comes for you as well. Sometimes in our worship we sing, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Sometimes we don't know what to do with the reckless love of God, and they didn't know what to do with it in Jesus' day either. So is there a barrier that has gone up in your life because of hurt or apathy or sin or human opinion? Something that's separating you from God that you need Jesus to come and break down. Tell him about it. Ask him to remove it. Give him permission. He waits at the well for you. But let me push you even a little bit further. Because I really believe that if we're going to follow the footsteps of Jesus, we need to think about who is it that Jesus is asking me to be gracious to? Think about it this way. Who's the last person that you would deem as good? The last person you'd ask for a favor who are the people you'd love to see defeated in an argument or for God to bring down and humble just a little bit? Now, maybe you would want them to be confronted or even converted, but it's only because you're convinced that you're right. And you would, you would still have a hard time accepting them as your equal in terms of worth and dignity and beloved. What, what Jesus does when he enters into this conversation with the Samaritan woman is so radical that it stuns the disciples. 
because it asked them to pursue a different type of kingdom. Jesus calls us to put aside the stereotypes that we carry and the prejudice that we nurse and the social, political, and cultural lines that we draw. And he invites us to look at people like we would look at the Samaritan woman as a sister, as an image bearer, as a co-worker in the kingdom of God, as a recipient of grace, and not as a harlot, a heretic, a foreigner, or a threat. So we need to ask, where in my life, God, are you calling me to break through the cultural norm and embrace a stranger and to offer forgiveness to someone who's hurt me? Could I be this radical? Fourth, Jesus sees without shaming. Look at verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become to them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, You're right to say when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, there is a time coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come and had now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming and And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This whole conversation with Jesus pivots when he tells her that he, what he knows about her life. Now we're not given the details of her story how she ended up in this circumstance or situation. Was it her own choices? Was it deception, abuse, misfortune? We don't know. But what we do know is enough for us to imagine her shame. Her actions show us that she prefers to be invisible. She goes out of her way to avoid the other women in her town. She heads to the well in the scorching heat of the day instead of the cool of the morning. She hopes to come and go undetected, carrying around in isolation whatever wound, sin, fear, or desperation that has complicated her history and has left her as she is. But then she sees Jesus, and Jesus sees her, and he sees the whole of who she is her past, her present, and her future, who she has been, what she desires and yearns for, how she hurts, all that she might become, and he names it all. And he does it without shaming or condemning her. He sees and names her situation in a way that does not make her feel judged, but loved. Not exposed, but shielded. Not diminished, but restored. He doesn't shy away from the painful or the ugly, the broken stuff in her life. He names it, 
but, in, but he allows that truth to come to the surface um, in a way that is filled with grace. He says, let's be real. Let's name it. No more games, no more smoke screens, no more posturing. I see who you are. Now see who I am. The Messiah. Your Savior. The one in whom you can find forgiveness and freedom and healing and transformation Spirit and truth, eternal life, living water, drink of me and live. How would you have responded if you met Jesus at the well? Can you imagine being in her place? Just give yourself permission just to to enter into the story and imagine what would that encounter be like? What in your own life would you be tempted to hide and hope that Jesus doesn't notice or doesn't know or doesn't bring up? What question might you be asked, might you ask of Jesus? Sometimes her questions are seen as a way of her avoiding the truth. I think she's actually curious. She's trying to satisfy her hunger and her hurt. How do you respond even this morning to the fact that Jesus sees you for who you are? He sees every one of us. Hiding is not helpful, nor is it necessary. He sees where you need to be forgiven and restored. He sees all of us who are carrying stories that are too heavy to bear. He sees how God wants to be at work in your life and then through your life. How he wants to use you for his glory. He sees you in all your potential and and beauty. He knows what grace can do in your life. He does not condemn us. Rather, in love, he invites us to trust him as our savior, redeemer, and friend. Jesus meets us where we are. Many people, particularly religious people, think that we need to get ourselves all cleaned up and in order before we come and open up our lives to Jesus. We need to fix the sin before we can talk to him about it, especially before we talk to someone else about it. But at the well in Samaria, Jesus reminds us that that he meets people where they are. He sees without shaming. And regardless of their choices and their mistakes and their beliefs, he meets us there. And finally, here at the well, Jesus saves and he sends. This is a broken and lonely woman drawing water in the heat of the day with no one else there, shamed, isolated, cut off and condemned because, she, because of the life she lives, confused by the scriptures about how to worship God. And yet here at the well, this same well, by the way, where in the past, in the Old Testament, God also drew Rebecca close and Rachel close and Zephora into the story of faith. This is not the first woman that, G- that God has met at the well in Samaria. But here she meets Jesus, the long-promised Messiah. She encounters Jesus of Nazareth who invites her to receive him as her savior, her greatest hope. On the cross, Jesus made that exchange possible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Just consider that verse. It's actually worth memorizing. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Just repeat it over and over again throughout your day. Use it like a breath prayer and just ponder its truth. 
that Jesus who knew no sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. He took on our sin, our guilt, and our shame, and he carried them away. He removed the barrier so that by faith we might have eternal life, the forgiveness of sin, and the honor of being a child of God. Despite her sinfulness, isolation, brokenness, and confusion, Jesus knew her. He met her, he redirected her, and he saves her. And in her infant faith, Jesus sends her. Look at verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything that I did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and they made their way towards him. This is a faith response. We see how, how tender and how, how still being established her faith is. But in response to what Jesus has done, she's so excited that she drops her water jar. She leaves it behind just like she was leaving her life behind. And she takes the hold of the living water that now has filled her heart and she runs back to the village and she tells others the story of the one who knows her and the one who came for her. What is remarkable is that in John's gospel, she's the first person that Jesus reveals his true identity to. She's the first believer in any of the gospels who straight away becomes an evangelist and brings others to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And we need to ask ourselves, where is God sending you this Easter season? Is there someone who you could share your God story with? Someone you could point to Jesus, maybe by just offering to pray for them about something real in their life, a place where they thirst. Maybe by inviting them over for a cup of coffee, inviting them into your life, or responding to their invitation to join them in their life. Maybe it's being bold enough to say, would you join me and come to church with me? It's introducing them to the one who has satisfied your thirst. Is there someone you could encourage by reminding them that God sees them and you see them too? Where is God sending you? John Vanier reminds us that Jesus came to give us life so that we may communicate that life to others. We embrace it for ourselves and then we share it with those around us. Jesus saves us and he sends us. And he is sending you too. Just imagine if Jesus had not come. If he had not made footsteps in Samaria. This woman's story would have been lost in the Samaritan sands. But he chose to leave footprints there. To enter into her life. He had to go to Samaria. He came with a promise of endless water and quenched thirst. A fresh start, a clean slate, living water flowing from within. Of all the places to find a hungry heart, Samaria. Of all the Samaritans to be searching for God, a woman. Of all the women to have a hunger for God, a five-time divorcee. I am the Messiah. Don't miss the drama of that moment. God is here. God has come. God has made a way for you. It is Christ. I want to invite our worship teams to come back at all of our sites and we're going to respond with worship in just a moment. But as they prepare to come, I want to invite you at each of our sites to stand with me now and we are going to pray together. And I want to invite you, if you're comfortable, just to close your eyes. And if you can, just even imagine that you are standing there at the well with Jesus. 
See him looking at you and knowing you. You don't need to pretend or hide. He's open to hearing your questions and responding to your need. He's inviting you to trust and follow him. To receive his offer of living water. Oh, gracious and loving Jesus. Thank you for taking the uncommon path. For leading with vulnerability. For breaking through the barriers of isolation. For seeing without shaming and for saving and sending. We are humbled honored and inspired by your deep love that reaches out to each one of us. Lord, would you forgive us for the times, the many times we have failed you and guide us back to the place of faith and trust and obedience. Grant us the vision to see ourselves, our circumstances as you see them with love and compassion. Jesus, today I pray for those who need a special touch from you, those who need encouragement or comfort or strength, who need to have their hope renewed. Oh Lord, by grace, grant them what they need to follow you. For those who have never trusted you and and are encountering you in a special way for the first time, Lord, give them the faith to say, Jesus, I choose to believe that you made a way for me through the cross. I receive your salvation, your living water, your eternal life. Father, I pray for those who need for forgiveness. Those who are held by the shackles of guilt and shame, may they encounter your mercy and receive the freedom of your forgiveness and love. I pray for those who need healing, Lord, you have promised that your healing will be accomplished in the kingdom of heaven. And so we ask for your kingdom to come today. And that you would bring your healing, your miraculous power, and you would restore that which has been taken away. May it be here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we ask for healed bodies and healed minds and healed emotions and healed relationships and healed families. We acknowledge our deep hurts, our hungers, and our thirsts that only you can satisfy. And we confess, Lord, our sin, and and we realize that we need your forgiveness. We need the provision of grace from the cross. And so we humbly come, choosing to believe that you will accept us as we are with all our past, our failures, and our sin. And by faith, we choose to drop the jar we've been carrying, a jar filled with regret and shame and guilt and the things that cannot satisfy. And we embrace you, the living water. Help us to understand the depth of your love and grace for us. And may we become like you in our thoughts and words and actions. Oh, Lord. Send us in your name to seek and to save those who are lost. And we pray all this in the name of the one who makes beautiful things out of us. Amen.